Okay, welcome to the welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight to it. The college consists of the following format. First, there will be a brief announcements period. Then our speaker will speak. Then after our speaker speaks, we will then um, have our question and answer period, as well as uh, have our infamous rebuttal period after that, where everybody can speak for a certain set amount of time. They, we generally finish up about nine o'clock and I'll keep the Zoom call open if we would like to hear more. Okay, Charlie, if you're ready, go ahead with the announcements. All right, now I'd like to introduce uh, Marty Peck. And Marty, I'll leave you to your own introduction and the floor is now yours to uh, present. Hi, thanks everyone uh, for having me here. Um, before I start, I wanna ask how many people have heard of long COVID? And just raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and for the, <laughs> for the people I can't see, I, I, we'll just, we'll yeah. just say, we'll, we'll, we'll hope that you, you have. Um, but I'm going to talk today um, about health disparities and long COVID. Um, a little bit about me, I am, uh, I'll just give you the quick rundown. Um, I have a BA in communication production from NEIU. I have a master's in political science from NEIU and I was working on a second master's in public health uh, at the start of the pandemic, moved to Colorado uh, the first week of shutdown. Uh, it was me and prime trucks on the freeway. I do not recommend <laughs> moving during a pandemic. Um, so I, I started, uh, started my program with Colorado University. Everything was remote. And I wanted to do something for my local community. So I got some training um, from school and signed up to be a uh, COVID investigator for Grand County in, uh, in Colorado. It's about an hour and a half north of Denver. It's very rural. Uh, there's a ski community there a ski resort there, uh, mostly it's ranchers, um, very conservative uh, area. So that's, um, I worked for, worked for public health doing that from August of 2020 uh, till December of last year. So I have been neck deep in COVID pretty much from the beginning uh, and figuring uh, we, at first it was like we flew by the seat of our pants uh, in Colorado, uh, putting, using spreadsheets to kind of track um, COVID cases and based on some conversations that I've had, uh, we were miles, miles um, ahead of Chicago and most other cities um, most other places. And I can tell you when we were talking before we started here about uh, the government and bureaucracy, people in public health are dedicated, smart, and um, exhausted. And we are leaving in droves because of um, lack of funding, lack of help, um, the political uh, pushback. Um, so that is, that's where I'll, I'll start here. And I'm just going to show, I want to show um, a quick video. It's six minutes. Uh, this is one of my, um, let me see if I can find it. One of my, One of our board members, um, three of my board members have long COVID. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna pull that up. And this is Alexandra. Yeah. 
and her um, her journey, her story. Let me put this stuff this here. You know the oh yeah, you know the process. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm trying to get back to Zoom. Okay, we got your, we got your. Yay, screen. it's working. Okay. okay. Here we go. All right. I know that I am by no means back to my old me. I definitely still get the chest pain intermittently. I can feel the inflammation in my lungs from the running. My endurance and that breathing issue is better when I'm doing spinning. The cognitive issues are still there. They're improving. What really is troublesome to me is the memory. Um, Losing my words, losing my place in conversations, forgetting things I talk to people about, um, and attention. Very difficult for me to watch TV or a movie. I keep having to rewind. I met with a neurologist about a week ago, and I'm going to get an MRI done and a blood panel to look for vitamin deficiencies and also check my thyroid but I am seeing improvements. I know it's not gonna be a straight line up. And so far it's been two steps forward, one step back, sometimes two steps back, but I know I'm going in the right direction. So here I am at TJUH in Center City and um, all, the, all these machines that you can see, um, I'm still having chest pains and they don't know why they run more tests here and everything is showing that I'm very healthy, but I'm still in pain. Um, this all started um, as a result of working out. I was getting tightness in my chest, which then turned into pain. And now the pain um, happens when I don't work out. It started happening in the last few days and it's continued day after day. Um, so at least now that they are, um, you know, they believe I'm in pain and they're going to do a cardio angiogram because some other tests are That's where we're at. Hi, Jen. The end point we hope is like near exhaustion, but for whatever reason you said, cannot go anymore, I stopped the test um, and we'll collect what we have. But okay. you're the boss. Just keep breathing. I'm going to set this up so when you're at has been an emotional roller coaster, particularly the last three months. It was really, the, the emotions were really running high in the fall. And then I slowly started to feel like I was getting better incrementally 
through December and January and February and going into March, I was feeling very optimistic. You know, I was starting to work out a solid three days a week. You know, I knew I wasn't near where I used to be physically before COVID, but I started to see glimmers of my old self. Yeah. I'm not sure if I would ever get back to being that person. And I've accepted that. Um, but then all of a sudden it was like at the end of March, someone took a pin and popped my balloon and I slowly just started feeling more fatigued and more fatigued. Thankfully, you know, working closely with leadership at Jefferson, I was able to get in to see a specialist very, very quickly. Um, and I don't take that for granted because I know that I'm lucky and I know there are so many people across the country who have to wait for weeks or months to see a specialist or they don't have access to those kind of specialists in their area. The person I was before COVID, I knew how hard to push her. I knew how much she, she needed. I knew what she was capable of doing. And I knew when, when I pushed myself too hard, sometimes I got sick and you know I had a rest, but this, my life now, I don't know how hard to push myself. I don't know when to rest. I don't know if something new is gonna pop up. And it just makes you feel defeated. Okay, so, so that is Alexandra's story. Um, and she is one of the lucky ones. She um, is from Philadelphia and works for one of the largest healthcare systems in the US, um, had access to pres the president um, of the hospital, had, uh, had every advantage um, of getting in and seeing specialists. She was still gaslit. People didn't believe her. Um, uh, and, and I'll talk more about that as, as we go on. Um, and, and I'm gonna reference uh, crashes um, uh, th throughout too. The uh, long haulers experience what's called a crash. And we'll get into that too, but I'm just gonna pull up my PowerPoint here, hopefully, and share this and we'll go from here. Okay. So what is long COVID? It goes by a whole bunch of different names, um, but COVID is a post viral infection that's caused by COVID-19. Having a post viral infection is not new. It's not something that, um, that you know, we haven't seen before, um, that medical professionals haven't dealt with. Um, what is new is the, uh, the, the millions of people who now have this and the millions of people who are going to get it as we continue down um, this COVID road. Um, what is frustrating for a lot of COVID or long COVID um, patients is that as we saw uh, with Alexandra, um, all their tests come back normal. They all look good. Um, they don't have anything on the outside physically showing where they're disabled, um, there's, they're, they, they just can't explain it, 
can't can't understand what's happening. Um, uh, post COVID names, long haul COVID, post acute COVID-19, post acute sequel of SARS-CoV-2 infection, PASC, uh, chronic COVID are just some of the names um, that they're using to describe this phenomenon. So the statistics are um, getting pretty scary, um, honestly. Uh, uh, we, we keep up on all of the peer reviewed research that's coming out. Uh, and what we're seeing right now, uh, what, what's being reported is 7.7 .7 million to 23 million people have developed long COVID. About 40% of COVID survivors across the world have or had long-term effects. Um, a University of Michigan uh, study took all the studies and um, came up with this statistic, about 40%. Um, most of the people who get long COVID are female, about 80, 75 to 85%. Um, most of them uh, are between the ages of 40, uh, start 40 and, and higher, uh, although certainly that is not the, the only cases. Um, there are millions of children who now are post-COVID, uh, have this post-COVID uh, infection. Um, and all of these stories, all of these problems uh, are not being covered in the media as they should be. Uh, which is why we're here. Um, a new study came out from the Dys Dysautonomia International. They study what's called POTS. This is a new study. It has not been peer researched uh, yet, um, but what I saw of, of the study, they sent out a questionnaire to over 2,000 people and based a study on that. So it, it sounds like it's, it's gonna be credible, um, but they're saying 38 million Americans have developed a nervous um, system disorder called POTS. POTS can range, there's, all, there's hun hundreds of symptoms for POTS. Post COVID, long COVID has um, 200, can have up to 200 system, um, symptoms. It just depends on um, how lucky you are, <laughs> how many of them you get, um, if you get none, or if you, you know, get a few. Um, but the long COVID is going to be a mass disabling event. Um, individuals who have ME, see more commonly known as CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, have been screaming. Um, for for a cure for decades, right? Um, and when long COVID first showed up, they really joined forces with long COVID um, uh, individuals, and uh, and and really um, guided them through symptoms and what they would be experiencing. Um, and being gaslit by doctors or P doctors and medical professionals not knowing what to do with them, um, which, is a, which is a really huge problem now. And, and of course, we know that that is gonna hit black and brown communities a lot harder. Not only is it gonna be mass disabling, but mass marginalizing um, for, for those communities. Um, CDC, <clears throat> lawmakers asked for a breakdown um, of long COVID statistics. The CDC, even though we have all of these reputable studies coming out from universities, from um, organizations uh, that NIH give money to for, uh, for funding, they uh, are not going to uh, have an official statement or, uh, or uh, give that information to lawmakers for two years. It's gonna take, they say two years to take uh, for them to do their process. So let's talk about the economy and money. Um, we are not going to have 
people who can work uh, on a regular basis. Um, uh, as I was saying, I have three long COVID board members. The only reason they have their jobs is because they are privileged, they can work from home, and um, were able to, you know, lay down if they needed to or take a break when they needed to and could could work from home that way. Um, a lot of people, I don't have statistics, but a lot of people are not able to go back to work when you are juggling these symptoms. So you can, uh, an example, my cousin, Nick, he's one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this documentary and started a whale of a tale. Um, but he uh, really has to monitor, and this applies to, to everyone really that um, I've watched and seen and met and heard over the past two years uh, who have long COVID. They have a certain amount of energy that they can expand, right? That they get, that they can use. Uh, and then they have a crash. So as an example, one weekend, Nick, my cousin Nick went out with his wife and they, you know, went to a car dealership, looked at a car and they went out to lunch. Um, you know, your typical weekend um, uh, running errand type of thing. Uh, he, he knew he should, shouldn't do it. And he did it. And for the next three weeks, he was in bed. Um, these, uh, they're, they're really finding a connection. Research is showing us there's a connection between ME, CFS, and long COVID. Long COVID patients are developing CFS um, along with, with POTS uh, and other uh, ailments that are really hard to detect, right? We don't have yet uh, a test that you can take to say, oh yeah, you have chronic fatigue syndrome. There has not been enough money invested in CFS, right? Because, you know, they're locked away, they're at home, they're homebound, a lot of them, um, and they, they don't have a voice. So there isn't, they weren't giving, given the funding to do that. So we are gonna have um, a very hard time worldwide dealing with the decrease in labor, um, the, the disability that is going to come uh, with this. Um, and, you know, we, we have to, our, you all know, I'm sure our healthcare system is ridiculous. Um, we, this, it, we really need to do this now. We need this change now because people are, are going to be swept under the rug and ignored. Um, so, and we're looking also at as new technologies develop, right? Um, uh, companies are going to be uh, focusing on that technology in order to compensate for the lack of people who are there, right? That can work. So health inequality, rural and urban. Um, so rural health deserts. Residents in rural areas in the United States tend to be older and sicker than in urban areas because they don't have access to um, medical facilities, doctors, um, pharmacies, like they do in, um, in cities. Uh, uh, and We'll go on from there, but we know in Chicago, <laughs> there are health deserts in Chicago too, right? So we all know that persons of lower income, education, occupational status experience worse, worse health and die earlier than do their better off counterparts. It's not rocket science. We've been screaming at the top of our lungs for years about inequity. So I've just listed some on um, the tip of the iceberg, some of the um, research that's out there. We know that the legacy of redlining um, has been just devastating to black and brown poor communities. We know that we can now add, unfortunately, long COVID to the long list um, 
that is killing these communities um, quicker. Uh, COVID-19 in rural counties, I can speak from personal experience that because of the political divide and how COVID came out and politically divided people, um, that there is um, a lot more dis disability, uh, a lot more deaths in these uh, rural areas um, because of that, right? They don't have, they don't have, you can't just, um, you know, take a bus or drive your car, um, you know, a couple miles down to see a doctor or go to a clinic. Uh, it's, it's very difficult in these rural counties, especially uh, during the winter and in hard weather um, or fires, <laughs> as we experienced also, um, to get to where you need to go in order to get help. So I'm just gonna give you a little pitch about our documentary. Um, we, Wheel of a Tale is a educational uh, documentary film organization. We are a 501c3. Um, the, what we're working on is this health inequity in rural and urban settings through the lens of long COVID. Uh, we want to inform and enhance critical thinking skills, which are desperately needed in our classrooms um, with, with the piece that we wanna do. There will be a companion lesson plan that teachers can use for, uh, to, to go along with this. So um, it's gonna be shown classroom sixth grade and up through college. Uh, we're gonna be entering at the documentary and film festivals to gain access to distribution channels. Um, and we have a lot of other networks that we are gonna to use to promote and get this out to people. So who are we gonna interview? We wanna uh, interview uh, indigenous population, of course, people of color, children, the long hauler children. Um, if you get on Facebook, you can join the, um, the uh, long COVID children's um, uh, support group, uh, long, uh, long COVID family support group. Um, you can go on any social media uh, and join a long COVID support group. We will be um, starting Wednesdays at seven on TikTok um our support group back up um we have we're, we're not doing it this month but um if you know anybody with long covid if you know anybody who are having symptoms who are not getting better after covid um these are the places that you should should send them um uh we're going to interview middle class family uh and of course doctors will be interviewing a gentleman who um was in New York running a long COVID clinic. He's now in Portland, starting one from scratch. Uh, there's, there are some all over the country that are associated with universities, um, which I highly suggest you send people to if you know them. Um, and uh, because they, they understand what's happening. Um, as I said, most people, a lot of people get gaslit uh, when their tests come back on normal, but they're still complaining. Um, they think it's psychological, something psychological, and it's, and it's not. Um, so uh, we'll be interviewing him. I'll be interviewing uh, uh, one of the doctors who um, helped create one of the, um, not the vaccine, but one of the, the medicines to help uh, if, if you get COVID so you don't get as sick. And I'm grasping at the word and I can't remember, but um, these are the references that I used. Um, be happy to send you this PowerPoint and you can check all of those out. Okay, questions, concerns. Okay, is that the end of your presentation? That's the end of my presentation, yes. Okay. We're going into the question and answer period now. I would uh, like you to, uh, I know you've been a, a done with COVID. I mean, I know you've had COVID. You've had some friends who've had long COVID. I, I have not had COVID. No, no, I meant you've had some friends who do this. Bob, I'm going to get to you next. I know you've got a question. What I'd like to know is um, 
what kinds of mitigation measures would you like to see around the public right now? And what do you think would be appropriate for? Uh, right. right now we have to go back to masks. Masks should be mandated everywhere, inside, everywhere. Um, uh, just the, the same as we had the beginning, uh, our numbers are going back up and we're gonna see this cycle continue. Variants are gonna come up. We do, we, we, there's, unless we get everybody vaccinated, we are going to have variants come up all the time. We're gonna see the waves come and we're gonna see the people getting sick, long COVID waves, because um, we aren't doing what we need to do in, in order to keep people safe. We're just not, the government is just not. We have an election coming up, right? We, um, COVID doesn't exist anymore. You know, they, it's, I could, I, I quit my job with public health because I could no longer ethically work for public health because they are caught between a rock and a hard place. You have these incredibly dedicated, hardworking, um, smart, frustrated public health workers seeing and looking at this data. And then you have their bosses saying, oh, well, we're gonna change how we, how we, we're gonna change how we judge that data or the criteria we're gonna change. Um, so, so, you know, so your counts aren't as high or we're not, we have states not reporting to the CDC anymore. You know, it, these are incredibly dangerous to our population worldwide, worldwide. Okay. So you, right. you advocate everybody going back to masks and- Social distancing, masks, yes. And shutting down the economy again if we need to. If, uh, I, I don't see that ever happening again because I don't think our government or anybody uh, would would back that. Um, uh, I, if, if a variant if, if a variant comes along that's really taken hold, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. The, uh, it, it, yeah, if I, if I were president of the world, you know, of course. I would be doing things differently, but um, I, my advice is to really watch other countries and the variants that are coming out of there. And if the, who says that they are variants of concern, make sure you keep an eye on them and when they reach the US. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, okay, I, I know I took the prerogative of asking the first question. I got four people, Bob Matter, Charles, Carrie, and Margaret. So. Bob, you got the, and those I'll, I'll ask in that order. And then if anybody else wants in, just chime in or let me know somehow, either with a hand or, or verbally. Um, but right now we got Bob, Charles, Carrie, and Margaret. So uh, Bob Matter, I'm gonna lower your hand and go ahead. Okay, uh, Marty, th these people that have long COVID, when, when they take COVID tests, are they still showing positive for COVID or are they showing that, no. that they're okay now? No. Um, they're they're not showing that they're positive for COVID. No, um, what they're what the research and scientists are telling us is that COVID can reactivate. Um, I know it can reactivate um, uh, the kissing disease. Um, what's that called? Mononucleosis. Mono, mono, uh, and the long term effects that mono has. So what's happening is it's a post viral infection. So it's no longer COVID, or it can be COVID. COVID, they're, they're seeing COVID hiding in different parts of the body. But what COVID does is activate these other, like autoimmune responses or POTS. You know, it, POTS is where your brain isn't communicating with um, the, the blood vessels. So if you stand up, you're, you can, you're, you're gonna pass out. Um, so there, there, I highly suggest, and there are, there are a hundred different, hundred different symptoms, 200 symptoms have been reported with long COVID and these they're, they're, they're seeing now are linked to other things, right? Like POTS, like, um, uh, uh, uh GI issues, um, all, all kinds of, um, autoimmune 
uh, stuff. I um, that that's. But I I want you I want you to take a look at my the the research that I've looked at, and um, that it will do a much better job at explaining than than I ever could. Um, but it's causing a there it's it's causing disabling events. Um, my my I the three of my direct who are on our board, who are three of the directors have long COVID and they got COVID, it was the first variant before there was a vaccine even, and they are still sick. It's been 24 months. One of them um, is, and this is sounds crazy. It sounds crazy, but they're allergic to mm -hmm. the air. They have to be in an air, in an air filtered room. We have people who can't eat. If they, if they eat something, it tastes like garbage. Um, and the, these, so, so we know that it's affecting our nervous system, that COVID is, is destroying the nervous system and, and affecting, you know, hearing. We have people losing hair and teeth. Um, the, this is what happens um, when you get that post COVID infection. Okay, and I have a follow up, and maybe uh, maybe Margaret Aguilar can chime in on this as well. What um, what is the uh, link between vitamin D and COVID? Like, it seems like people who took vitamin D seem to be uh, resilient to uh, to COVID, even if they're older or overweight, like typical victim of COVID. But people that had uh, taken vitamin D or got lots of sunlight seem to be uh, relatively immune to it. What's that link there? There, there was actually, um, and uh, there's actually something that I read where that is, unfortunately, that, that vitamin D, um, what, they, what they were hopeful for really wasn't um, a cure for it. I know um, listening to or, or protecting you from getting COVID. Um, I know that listening to um, long COVID people, uh, patients, uh, vitamin D is stripped out a lot. They, they all have uh, uh, vitamin D deficiency, but I have absolutely, I'm not a medical professional by any means. So um, I, I don't know how that linkage or, or why that is, um, but that research um, is, is out there. Okay, any anything else, uh, Bob, or should we move on to no. Charlie? Okay, Char all right, Charlie, you got the next question. Yes, uh, thank you, Marty, for your talk. Uh, I'm a union representative, and the one guaranteed way to fire an, an employee, of which there is no appeal, is absenteeism from work unless you can establish you have a disabling condition, a disability on their EEO. Do you, by any chance, have you gotten into yeah. if yeah. this I, is being recognized by employers? Because yes. they refuse to do so. Um, no, it, it is. The um, Biden administration made long COVID, if you're diagnosed with long COVID, it is a, dis, it is, uh, a disability. Um, of course, we all know the, the disability system <laughs> and actually getting that diagnosis, getting improved, which is part of the problem, right? Um, uh, I'm gonna lose track, but um, it, it, we're, we're taking these at-home tests. So you get a positive at-home test. I'm, I'm telling you what you wanna do, you wanna go to your doctor. Uh, right away your pharmacy and get one that is not self-reported that is in the system that will go to public health because you want that on record so if you're taking a test at home and you say oh i'm positive you know um down the line there may be repercussions with you not getting covered for disability or not getting covered um for for these things and i have to say um, I mean, I'm not happy with the Biden administration and a lot of things, but they really did put together a good um, COVID and long COVID um, uh, uh, plans that they want to implement. 
Um, unfortunately, the political will behind that, it's just not there, right? It's that that political will is not um, able to do, is not able to push that forward. Um, and I think that uh, that it, we're, we're going to need that. We, we will definitely need that. Um, Kane um, has has a bill that he that he put forward also. I know that there are six Democrats and one independent who are backing it, but uh, I don't see that being passed anytime soon either. Thank you. I, in the past, I came across, you had a report uh, getting COVID. You had 48 hours there, somewhere in the past. No one wants to hear that, they Charlie. Tried to impose oh, which one was that? Were. Which one was who just spoke? Charles Paydock. No, I'm sorry. Arvind. Arvind. Okay. One of our trolls. Sorry about Tim, that. Tim, just be quiet. Yeah, it's JJ. We got it. We're getting them out of there. That's what I thought. Okay, oh. go ahead. Sorry uh, about that. I'm done. I just said. If you what she's saying is you have to get a government test and uh, uh, what what I would recommend what I would hours. strongly recommend right you see they they send us all these great free tests yay wonderful yay we can self test we we can stay at home get it in a system somewhere get it to public health that's my base you know I I have a master's in political science I've been in this. For two years, I'm telling you now, you want to make sure that you have proof that you have had COVID. That's my advice. Okay. Um, all right. Is that it, Charlie? All right, Carrie, you got the next question. Please go ahead. All right. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm, I, I appreciate you've done all this research and you found a lot of information that I have looked for and not been able to find. So, for instance, I mean, do you have? Can you recommend places to go to get the the the, 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 niche, yeah, the, the niche statistics specifically? Things like, um, what if the, to what extent does being vaccinated protect you against long COVID? My, what I saw was that it was like cut it in half, but I'm you know it was not a terribly reliable source, and I'd like to see you know I have a lot of questions like that. Where where do I get that kind of information? That that's a great question, and there isn't enough research out there. But what we are finding is that because of all the breakthrough cases, um, if you're getting COVID, you can get that post-viral condition. You can get that post-viral infection. Um, and if we have millions of people now still getting COVID, it's not going to slow down that pace. Um, I I there I don't know of any research with that looking at that specific question. Um, but that is that is what um, that is what I just based on on what I know what I'm seeing is it's it's not going to stop it. Um, I would it may, but um, I, I saw something somewhere that, that implied that being vaccinated if you got COVID mm -hmm. there was about half the chance it would become long COVID compared to if you were not vaccinated. There may, yeah, there, there, pro there probably is some science to that if we have the antibodies right in our system already. Um, but like I said, I am not a doctor. I do not do research or anything. I just, I just find that. What I, I recommend looking at, um, go to Google Scholar if you don't already. Um, Google Scholar to pull up research, and I'll, I can send um, Charles a link that he can forward to you guys um, that, that we use to look at research. I also strongly recommend social media. Um, uh, there are a lot of great people out there, uh, uh, epidemiology uh, epidemiologists on like TikTok who do a really good job with explaining COVID, explaining the new variants and what they're seeing. I highly, highly recommend doing a TikTok profile so you can get in and see see that what's happening okay is that it uh, carrie all right margaret you're next 
Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I, this is the first time I've been able to get on a, a Zoom call since these guys who were trolls, uh, they they put a thing on me from, from Zoom, so I had to write letters and stuff. But anyway, so I'm glad to be back. Hello to everybody. And um, my, my question, my comment about, but I'm a registered nurse, that's why they're talking okay. about, but I'm retired. So I'm not up on all of this, a lot of this stuff, but the vitamin D, as far as I understand, is that help to prevent people from getting COVID, that you were more likely not to get, you were more likely to get COVID if your vitamin D levels were low. The, the mechanism of that, I don't think was understood. Um, the second thing is, uh, the, my question is, and I'm sorry, I missed this. What does POTS stand for? That's a great question. It is a very long. <laughs> of course. It's a very be, long. Before I go, I'm going to be back in about 20 seconds here. A cat's got to get taken to bed. So just. Okay. <laughs> POTS syndrome is a postural orthostatic uh, tachycardia syndrome. Postural tachycardia? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Your heart rate, your heart goes up because your heart is wants to get blood to your brain. And it can't because the, brain can't. Is all, the blood is all pulled in your legs because your arteries don't constrict. Okay, got it. Yeah. Um, I hadn't heard it like that. That was sweet. Uh, we had orthostatic hypotension was what we called it. But there you go. <laughs> it's a little shorter. <laughs> I put I put the link in the in the chat if you want to go to that. And, and then the last question is that, that uh, you know, the people in terms of, of diagnosing the post COVID thing, someone was saying that uh, was asking, how do you know it's not psychological? And I'm sure that some of the tests are abnormal. No, no, the oh, tests are normal. I'm sorry, aren't the oxygen sat tests normal, uh, abnormal? Yeah, but that that's that's for COVID. Um, no, but even post COVID, aren't the, the sat some tests people so, some people, but most what we're finding is that it's resembling CFS. So okay, there's so no tests that you can take to say, oh, that's that's CFS. Like Alexandra, it her if if you didn't see it, the um like uh, her tests all come back normal. That's very common. It's incredibly common. So they are gaslit, or they are said, oh, it must be psychological because so the, your tests. So then, basically, post-COVID is diagnosed on symptomatic stuff uh, on. On what, yeah, on per, on the person's reports of symptoms rather than actual, right? Doctors. And yeah, and and showing, you know, they're chronically uh, chronic chronically fatigued, right? If they push themselves, if they if they use their energy, they they have a crash, right? So if you're if you only have a certain amount of energy, like my cousin Nick, you know, he went out for for the weekend, ran errands, did did a bunch of stuff, and was in, in bed for three weeks. Um, you know, it it it's like CFS. A lot of this is morphing into CFS. Um, yeah, I get that. There's yeah, there is no there is no test, um, but all to to say oh you have C CFS. There there isn't a, a mechanism yet that they have that they can say this is what it is or this yeah, is I, I thought that they had positive epstein bar virus or some kind of yep, thing they, like yep, that. that's that's what happened to alexandra um she it re it reignited epstein bar in her okay um, and okay. then she right and and with that you know other symptoms like i and you can be you know even if you are asymptomatic have mild symptoms or, or are greatly affected by COVID, any of that, you can develop long COVID. I know the, C the chronic fatigue syndrome for a long time was diagnosed as psychosomatic. Matt, yes, yes. And because it was mainly women, you know, well, you know, a woman, a woman went to the doctor and she was totally discounted. And my cousin happened to my cousin like that. And she really suffered a lot with it. This, but, it's the same um, thing. Same she probably thing. got it from a post-viral illness, right? 
You know, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Because, you know, this was years ago, so I don't even know if they had it down that far. So, yeah, there, there, there's all kind of linkages now that they're, that they're looking at discovering. So there's some things, but it's kind of vague at this point then. Well, I mean, there's, there's over 200 symptoms if you have long COVID. Um, brain fog is huge. Yeah, but these um, aren't things that you can, you can right. pinpoint with actual test results. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so I was wrong when I said oxygen tests and all that stuff. I'm sorry, I apologize to whoever okay. it is that I said that to, but because um, I put it in the chat. But um, but I know that um, my cousin really did suffer from it. I mean, she was really, she had like six kids or something. God help, that should oh be my God. grounds for anything anyway. But uh, she really just, lost all energy and it wasn't something that she wanted to do you know so yeah people are being gaslit and they're 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 saying oh you know you're you're crazy i have a good friend who has pots who was just diagnosed but he's had it since 2013 and was just recently told well you're just not trying hard enough to get better you're <laughs> just not you know you know it's absolutely ridiculous and frustrating and um, it's, I can only imagine what black and brown people are going through, right? I mean, because most of the people that you see on social media are, you know, white women, you know, my age, and we scream, we, we, we have a voice. Um, what we're not seeing are a lot of people from black and brown communities who don't have insurance, who can't get in to see a doctor, who, you know, um, can't get to the clinic. So how are they suffering? that is that is a big deal yeah i guess um we have to stop uh labeling people as psychosomatic when they very well may be an actual cause of it like the gentleman who's questioning my judgment here <laughs> i got a chat <laughs> all right i'm done all right, now I'm going to let Brian go next before I do you, Charlie, because you had a question already. So, Brian, go ahead. So, how do they know the difference between what would be long COVID or what might be an adverse reaction to the vaccines? Like well, how there's, is no that? Scientific, there's no scientific study or no science, science behind um, any mass outbreaks or any any anything that the vaccine has caused in people. If there if there if there were like let's just take the blood clots for instance, right? So there was only I don't know seven people. I'm sure that there there have been more since then. But it, it, say if if people were getting blood clots thousands of people were getting blood clots because of a vaccine then yeah that that is that's something that the vaccine caused but we don't we don't see people who never had covid who have gotten the vaccine come down with long covid we um people uh people who did not have access to a vaccine who are unvaccinated um, with the first variant, have long COVID. All right. So uh, the, the the vaccines are are. I mean, that technology has been around for thirty years. It's not like it's it's new. It's not like it needs to be. You know, they they know that it's safe. Like have I was you, like, oh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Have you seen the recent uh, Walgreens data? that shows that uh, like they, they did testing around the country and they listed it by vaccination status. So based on the recent like rolling seven, you know, they're doing a rolling seven days. Mm -hmm. So unvaccinated people are testing at about 20%, whereas people with three doses and more than five months have passed are testing at about 32% of positivity. So, I mean, there's, there's roughly a 50% increase, right? If you're unvaccinated, it appears yeah. as though, based on that data, you have a 50% less likelihood of getting COVID. 
what the uh, I can tell you from, from personal experience when I was COVID investigating. When so, so vaccine came, people got vaccinated. This was a new variant. It was the Delta variant. A third of the cases um, were va fully vaccinated people. So it's the variants that are coming in, are are evading, are evading the um, are, are still able to make us sick. These new variants are still able to make us sick. Um, what they know and the research that we have is that when you are vaccinated, you are not going to get as sick as someone who is not vaccinated. Well, so, so what that appears to say to me, right, I mean, mm -hmm. is that if you're fully vaccinated and boosted, mm -hmm. you have an increased likelihood of getting COVID. Not at all. But your symptoms are, are, are going to be less. Well, I mean, I'm just talking about the Walgreens data. I mean, Walgreens, based on that data, I mean, if you're, you have a, you know, 30, you know, 32% of those tests are, be, are testing positive. Whereas unvaccinated people are testing at about 20%. So why is there a higher percentage of fully vaccinated, boosted people getting COVID? You know, I I don't know. I want to know who who does who does that testing. Um, who who Walgreens. put out those statistics. Walgreens? I'll I, I'll Great. put the link in the chat. But Great. you also awesome. need to know how they chose their sample. Well, so I understand that. I mean, there is, you know, the, the population sample, it's not a peer reviewed study. It's just data, right? If the people, so, chose, the people that, chose to go to Walgreens to get tested, there's a self selected group of people who are sick, feel sick. I mean, you look at the total number of people getting sick. Out of the total number of people getting sick, those that were not vaccinated are getting sick at a much higher rate than those that were. That's the, that's the, you look at the total number of people getting sick, not the ones that were tested at Walgreens. That's, it's an irrelevant number. Well, I, I'm just reporting. I, I mean, I, I put the link in the chat. I mean, it, you can see it. I mean, you know, according to Walgreens and, you know, population sample, I understand. You that's know, it's not a well, study, really but just tested. based on that data, you know, 20% of unvaccinated people are testing positive and 32% of fully vaccinated boosted people are testing right. positive. So, you know, why that is, or, you know, I don't population, know. Population like seventy percent are vaccinated, but more, but but of the people getting sick, seventy percent are unvaccinated. No, the, but they only they take it by category. They take it by category, so it's only. I'm not talking about Walgreens. I'm talking about hospital admissions. I'm talking about hospital. I'm talking about actual numbers, not not just those. Well, choosing to go out and test it at Walgreens. Well, Walgreens are real numbers. I mean, those are numbers so, that Walgreens so, has. I mean, they're just publishing. Well, sure had. I didn't go to Walgreens to get tested. Well, I'm not, not, a, not a random sample of people. Yeah. Okay. Okay. To be tested. All right. Let let let's uh, before we go down this rabbit hole, Ryan, <laughs> you have any more questions, real quick? Uh, no, I mean, I'm just wondering how that, that distinction's made between what would be, because it's correlation versus causation, right? I mean, it's not necessarily just because you know, the, the numbers correlate doesn't mean that right. they cause each right. other. So right. I'm just Absolutely. wondering, you know, how, how they would distinguish long COVID from vaccine adverse reactions and has that been studied? And I, I mean, apparently. Yes. Yeah, all of the, they would not put, the, the vaccine, the vaccines are, are safe, that they, they would not be using MNRA in a way to make us sicker or to do anything to us or it's that the people that I know of public health these are they're not politicians they're not politicians um, these are doctors epidemiologists um, scientists research scientists who study this and look at this they they these these people are you know, take a vow not to harm people. They are the ones that developed this vaccine. Those people know what they are doing. It's the government that um, that that may or may not keep us safe. But the vaccine that was developed by these people, by public health, is safe. I promise you. 
Well, These people are good, smart. Yeah. Let them well, we'll finish numbers, first but... and then we'll get to you, all right? God damn it. Sorry about that, Marty. It's okay. Go ahead. Are we, are we, are we, are, uh, okay, Brian, let you get your done, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, I, you know, like no one has the long term data. They, these okay, these okay. vaccines have been out for, right. in, let's, in let's... large use, for a year and a half. I don't, okay. you know, the safety date is unknown. That's all, right, all I can right. say. All right, Brian. Okay, Charlie, you're next. Go ahead with your question. Okay, first of all, I've got a statement. Brian, they asked 95% of the people. Charlie, let the, well, we've got hey, the rebuttals at the Charlie, rebuttal uh, period. Sam, Brian, they asked 95% of the people in the hospital where they vaccinated, and they said no. Now, the question I have is of Marty. There, there is no data for you, Brian. How's that data? Um, it's easy. You're gonna PS people in the hospital, but anyhow, um, what exactly is a crash? If I go to a manager and I say I'm representing an employee and they're going to likely crash from time to time, and the manager is going to ask me, sir, Mr. Paydock. What precisely would that mean regarding, let's say, attendance? A, a crash is, is a crash is 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 an onset of your symptoms or more intense symptoms if you're still experiencing them. Um, uh, I'll just go from let's say Alexandra. She knows that you know, like. She went out and shot some video for, for a project that she was working on for the hospital, um, met with some people, you know, she was feeling okay, it was a good day, she, it, it, she felt okay, um, and then, you know, the next morning she couldn't get out of bed. So it's, it, it is really, I mean, there's no clear cut definition of what a crash is, but it's um, for people who experience um, uh, um, Malaysia, Malaysia, am I saying that right? Medical people. Um, thank you. Uh, that it, it's, if you exert yourself, your, your body is just going to crash. Your, um, as CFS patients, what the, the researchers they're looking at is that the cells for whatever reason, uh, are not producing that energy that normal cells do to keep us active and moving and awake. Um, so it's um, the, the best that I can describe that crash is that you just become physically unable to do things. Either because you're, you're tired, you have um, Brain fog, brain fog is a huge one. It's huge. Um, uh, people are not going to be able to. A day or two, a day, two or three or. It depends. Who knows? No, it depends. There's, there's no set time frame. There is. This is all. There, there's. We don't know. Some, you know, some people recover in two days. Some maybe two weeks. Some maybe two months. Some maybe never. Right. I mean, we're looking at we, we just don't know enough um, yet about what's happening. OK. Um, all right. Anybody else have any more questions? Because I know we still got a lot going on here. If not, Tom, do you have a question? Nope. OK, fine. Marty, um, mm -hmm. as far as you're concerned, um, I know you've seen the you were recommending mask mitigations and all this stuff like this. Um, how, uh, I guess what I'm asking for is how, what, what are you doing now after your public health stint and, uh, how are you, uh, are you actually getting out at all or that kind of thing or just what, what do you Yeah. Doing? Yeah. I mean, I go out, um, I moved back to Ohio to be with my kids. Um, but we're now only meeting, we're going to the pool, we're being, we're being outside. I have friends over, we go to the fire pit and drink. Um, so, you know, just, just being cautious, just staying six feet away, wearing your mask. I always wear my mask when I'm out. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so difficult because I really, really want to start dating again. And <laughs> the, I, I, I just, I, I just, I'm not gonna, I, I just can't put myself in a position where, um, you know, it, there's a chance that I can get sick. I, I just, uh, like I said, I've been doing this for two years. I talk to people every day. I read stories every day. I don't want to risk that because I see what people have lost and it is devastating. Um, and what, what are your primary sources of where you get your information from? I'm just curious. That's why. Uh, my connections at public health. Okay. Um, my, yeah, connect and and uh, I'll send you different links to um, to different researchers. OFM, the oh, shoot, Open Medicine Foundation. Um, they do a lot of work with um, with ME and CFS. Are looking at long COVID now. Um, uh, ME CFS Cure, I believe. Um, but there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of stuff that, that comes out. Bloomberg is, is really good, um, with reporting, uh, new studies and new things that the government is trying to implement, um, which is a great source. Um, you know, uh, there's, uh, I know a gentleman who edits, um, medical, uh, medical, journals um, for and studies coming out of the NIH um, that that I can uh, that I can send you a link to to that um, when you get a chance but, yeah yeah absolutely um, and, and before we move on to other questioners is there any country in the world right now that has seeming to got the COVID mitigation strategy right I don't know um, I, I don't think that there. No, I'm, I'm just curious. I, I, that, that got it right. I think New Zealand did. Um, uh, they've opened up though again. I think it's pretty much uh, being accepted now that that countries are opening up, that these leaders are gonna open everything up again. Um, and uh, I just pray that, you know, these mitigations and they, there, there's no political will to continue fighting COVID. There just isn't. Um, you know, they, they're concerned about the economy. They're concerned about these elections, and um, what they should be concerned about is the lack of people that are going to be around to do jobs um, uh, around the country. You know, around the world. You know, I we. <laughs> you know, transportation, um, export, import, I, that's all we are, we are going to pay a very high price, a very high price that we are not yet paying um, what, from what I see coming down the pike. And what is it specifically that you see coming down the pike, if you don't mind me asking? Please. Just the, these, these millions and millions of people who, with long COVID, who will not be able to work or who will not be able to work um, like we used to. Um, we don't have the public health infrastructure. We don't have the healthcare system uh, that we need in order to support uh, these people and, and what is going to be happening. So you're saying that there's going to be a lot more increase in long COVID cases, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that you're absolutely. Going to be, probably be seeing a lot more disability claims and a lot more uh, mm -hmm. public awareness on this. And the, the government's aware of that. And like I said, the Biden administration has put together some really good things, but it it's not going to get funded. Okay, uh, I guess I'm going to go back to Brian, who just raised his hand. So, Brian, go ahead, please. So, are you are you aware of any? Um, like alternative treatments, alternative medicines. I, and I know you're not a doctor. I'm not asking for medical advice. I mean, the, you know, I, I just, you know, just in general, I mean, are there things like if people are suffering from long COVID, 
you know, I mean, are there alternative treatments to kind of lower or lessen the symptoms? Yeah, yeah. And um, I, don't, I, I can't speak to them, um, but <laughs> get online to any long COVID support group and you will, and, and people will be, will, will have help uh, or tell you what worked for them or works for them. Um, uh, you know, vitamins, Alexandra went through, you know, takes a handful of vitamins, like you saw, you know, every day. And um, there's, <laughs> there, there is no one specific thing that they can take. Um, it's really, it, and it really depends on your symptoms, right? So if, if someone is really tired all the time, they're, they're gonna need something other than someone who, I don't know, has, I don't know, muscle pain or, um, yeah. yeah it, it's, it, and that's really what researchers and doctors are really trying to figure out um, how to deal with this and how to cure this. And there is some really good um, uh, research and programs underway, like at, oh, I cannot stress, OFM is wonderful. Um, uh, and uh, the um, Open Medicine Foundation. It's a worldwide collaboration of um, Stanford is involved. They have um, different universities around the world who, who are looking at um, a, a test to detect if you have CFS uh, and, and looking at different cures and, um, for, for that. That'd be OMF, not OFM. <laughs> Oh, uh -huh. Yeah, I've, I've got omf.ngo up now on my other computer. Is it OMF? Ohio yeah, Open OMF. Medicine. I'm sorry. Yes. Open Medicine Foundation. Yes. Yeah. So what about like, um, you know, just taking a walk in the sun? Like, I don't because I, I mean, I heard a lot about vitamin D and that people were in the house and might have made things worse because they weren't getting enough sunlight. I mean, has there been any, you know, kind of that? Like, I don't know, just things. I think, I think we all, as a human being, right? We're like plants. You just need water in the sun, yeah. <laughs> nutrients right. in the sun. Um, I think it's great for our mental, mental and physical health to be outside and in the sun and, and walking and um, all of that. Yeah, I think that's part of a holistic thing. Um, has it specifically to COVID and, or long COVID? I don't think any more than anything else. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, Charlie's got another question, so go ahead, Charlie. Charlie, Kami. Oh, come on. Uh, you got to unmute, Charlie. Go ahead, Charlie. I was wondering if it's accurate to say that there appears to be one essential feature to getting a vaccine vaccinated and or a booster is that it reduces the likelihood, one, you're not likely to go in a hospital and more importantly, you're not likely to die. And I believe that has remained consistent over time, if I'm correct. That's, that's what I've run across, those are, those are the numbers that I'm seeing, yes. Thank you. All right, who else has a Is question? Brian? Sorry, Charlie. Go ahead. Go ahead, Charlie. You had a corollary. Please. No, I just wanted to make certain Brian heard that. I heard I heard you, comrade. Thank you. <laughs> um, Bob, you haven't had one in a while. What else? Anything else you want to add and or contribute? Because I know you're of a little bit different persuasion than most of us here on the college. Uh, yeah, I, I keep hearing uh, all this uh, business about all the, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, people of color and uh, indigenous people and the marginal, you know, and the gays and the trans or marginalized communities are higher risk, blah, blah, blah. How much of that is due to uh, perhaps uh, having, you know, being obese and uh, you know, diabetic, poor lifestyle choice rather than having more, uh, you know, more pigmentation in your skin. Well, let me tell you, let me, let me ask you this. So uh, if you lived in a black and brown community, how many 
Yeah, I have for about 50 years. Oh, great. Fantastic. How many grocery stores are you close to? How many pharmacies? How many um, clinics? If you, um, you, you know, the the research, I mean, we, the research is crystal clear that um, these communities don't have the resources that they need. They don't, my first documentary looked at um, standardized testing and how it was used to close public, how it was used to close public schools. So, you know, the, if you don't have the resources, if you don't have what you need in order to eat healthy or have the education to understand how or and what you need to eat healthy, of course, you're going to have these, uh, these, these conditions. Of, of course, you know, you, of course, you're going to be, be less advantaged and, and more prone to, to illness. We're talking about healthcare. I'm sorry. Tom didn't mute himself yeah. and he's talking to his wife. Oh. <laughs> muted, Tom. Tom, I just muted you because of some external extraneous noise. Please feel free to unmute and join us when you're ready. I just muted you, Tom, so my apologies. We were just had some noise in the background. Uh, feel free to unmute when you want to. So please go ahead, everybody. All right, uh, Charlie, was that, was that the end of your question? Okay, uh, who else has a question now? Uh, Raj, we haven't heard from you. Tom, I'm sure you got something. Oh, okay, Carrie, go ahead. I'm sorry. I have no question, okay. No, no, that's okay, Carrie. I just, I just saw you. My apologies. I, I, I put it in chat, but the Walgreens website explains why the young vaccinated have a lower positivity rate. The vaccinated are people that that have to be tested every three days, so they get a lot more tests. The vaccinated people only go in when they think they're sick. I, put, I, I quoted records from the Walgreens Walgreens website right ahead of where those numbers are. Mm -hmm. That's it. I'm done. All right. Um, all right. Who else has a question? Anybody? Because if not, we can proceed to rebuttals uh, if your guys are all done. But and I'm going to um, just I'm going to put in my email address. OK. Into the chat if anybody has any questions or concerns. And I'm just going to make really quickly a pitch one more time. We we need your help. If you can share whale of a tail. Uh, on on your media, on Facebook, uh, we need money to uh, to get this up and going. Um, we're budgeted for about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, so we can to to do and finish uh, the documentary. Um, uh, we are you can you can write it off. We are a five hundred one c three. Also, so so if you could if you can please make a donation. If you can please share it. That would that would help us out. We're going to have merchandise up soon. Um, we're going to be reformatting our our um, web page here shortly, also. Um, but uh, thank you guys again for having me. Okay. I appreciate it, and I hope you learned something. And well, feel free Marty, to reach like out. To, like thank you, you thank our speaker. I'd like you to stick mm -hmm. around because we're going to have start going to a rebuttal session now. Oh, okay. There'll be. Um, You'll get the last word, and uh, oh, so, okay. And you'll get the last word at the end of the story. So we're okay. kind of uh, uh, lax on questions tonight because they usually go a lot longer. But anyway, that's okay. All right, who's got a rebuttal tonight? No rebuttals. Okay, Margaret, you got the first one. Okay. Oh, I'll just start, and I'm sure somebody will throw okay. in. Uh, Charlie's got one. Who else? <laughs> Uh, Tom, you want to rebut? Uh, Brian's rebutting. Okay. I don't. Raj, you going? Okay. I'm done. Oh, you're done. Oh, you want to? You want to rebuttal, Raj? No. Okay. I'm I don't. Serious. So we got Margaret. Shine. We got Margaret. We got Charlie. We got Brian. Bob's. You want to do? Okay. Bob, you want to do one? Yeah, I'll do a shorty. Okay. And. Uh, Vicki or Tom Barry or anybody else? 
Okay, well, so we got four. I may go, I may not. I'm not sure yet, but I'll give you guys each about six minutes so that we can go into a rebuttal and give you guys a little time. I'll run a counter. I'll run a clock on my end, which is, uh, and I'll remind you at six minutes when we go. So, Margaret, if you want to go first, please do so. Sure. Um, I spend, a, I'm from Denver and I spent a little bit of time in Granby and it's really beautiful there. You were in the mountains. <laughs> For a year, it was amazing. Just an incredible experience. I was so lucky to live there. Yeah, it's, it's really a spectacularly beautiful place. Anyway, um, I guess uh, uh, I, one of the things about, about the long COVID, I think that they're finding out, and I'm, haven't, I really have not been following this as closely as I have to open my mouth and talk about it. But it seems as if, you know, you have different body systems. You have a neuro, neurological system, and the neuromuscular system where they intersect and are dead controlled by. And you have the, the gastrointestinal system and you have the urinary tract system and you have the pulmonary system and the cardiac system. And it seems like that the, with the long COVID, sometimes the virus affects one system more than it does the other. That's what my understanding of it has been. I don't know if that's changed or even if whatever, but it's obviously something that people are, are it's one of the things that makes it crazy. Um, you know, when people, one of the things that I just, this is not really unknown like you were saying, but one of the things is, is if you think about chicken pox, people get chicken pox and then 50 years later, they get shingles. And it's because of the chickenpox virus that hid along the, the, the nerve, a peripheral nerve um, on one side of the body and breaks out again 50 or 60 years later. And the person sometimes has a really hideous result from it. If it's on the face, it can cause blindness and all that kind of thing. Anyway, so this is not unknown. We, we, we don't know a lot about viruses. <laughs> even though we think we do. At any rate, then um, I guess, um, and then the, the thing about psychosomatic, I think my impression is the reason they don't think long COVID is psychosomatic is you have a large number of people who are not related to each other, who aren't in the same kind of thing who are reporting the same kinds of, system, of symptoms. And if you have something that's psychosomatic like that, often it is, you know, all the kids in the school are saying, oh my God, I'm sick because somebody else got sick. And, and they really are, feel sick, but it's influenced by, the, by the, the fact that other people that they know are sick. So this is something that's widespread and, and, um, and because the people are, are reporting the same kinds of symptoms, I think that's one of the reasons they're thinking that it doesn't, he's shaking his head. <laughs> okay, that's all right. Anyway, that's just my opinion. That's just my opinion, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> anyway, so that's it. But um, I guess, and, and I want also, just make a real point about vitamin D. They didn't think it would made things better if you got it. They think it helped you to, from it helped to prevent you from getting it. Is, is so it's at the beginning. It's a prevent. It is probably somewhat of a preventative, and even then, it's not. You know, you, you and you can overdose on vitamin D. It's one of those fat soluble vitamins that kills your liver if you take too much of it. So you know, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> you know it's just like anything else okay uh, thank you for your presentation i really appreciate it it's it's fact-based which sometimes the presentations here are not and um and i really appreciate your your interest and in, and in, in your dedication to what you're doing and um i wish you luck in trying to figure out when to date <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck, Marty, with that. I mean, yeah, uh, take care. 
Take care. All right, Margaret. Thanks for commenting tonight. Uh, uh, I'm going to let you go, uh, Charlie, last because you usually like to. Brian, go ahead and uh, start commenting if you want. So, I, yeah, I don't know. The uh, long COVID, the, um, you know, vaccine injuries, um, what's the difference? I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, my issue with all this stuff has been and is where the vaccines have been mandated and people are taking them just to keep their jobs that, or to go to school, that this use of coercion to take away people's informed consent and compel them to get these vaccines has been a very wrong headed idea from the start. And um, I, I can't imagine being a person who, you know, got three COVID jabs against their will and then got COVID, you know? Um, <clears throat> so it's the mandates, you know, that, uh, you know, I think coerced a lot of people into getting these vaccines that didn't want them, you know, may or may not have benefited from them. The mortality rate among young people is very, very low. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, ultimately, I, I hope that the people who supported these vaccine mandates, you know, and now are realizing, you know, a year later that they didn't know everything and <clears throat> things change. So, you know, and that was a concern at the at the get go that was overridden by people's fears. So I really hope people who supported these vaccine mandates can, you know, think about this, you know, and, um, you know, the long term ramifications of compelling people against their will to get a, a drug without long term data. Thank you. OK, Brian, that's good. Um... Bob, you're next. If you want to say something, go ahead. Okay. Well, a lot of this, uh, you know, I think, you know, when, uh, when the, when the data is crunched and, uh, you know, now that, now that some of the uh, restrictions have been list, uh, lifted on, on discussing this stuff, I think we'll see more information come out, you know, in the, in the future, it should be quite interesting. Um, I've always been curious about these links between uh, COVID and all the, uh, you know, I'm talking about COVID deaths now, really, the links between uh, COVID and then uh, these other other conditions uh, that people had, like like diabetes. And I, I believe the figures uh, were something like 80% uh, of the deaths were in people that had already reached their life expectancy anyway. And a good chunk, like I think something like 40% of the deaths, the people also had diabetes, which indicated that they were uh, obese. So, so there's, you know, there's some real, real links there. And, uh, and it's kind of, uh, it's kind of funny that, uh, you know, the government's not doing more to encourage uh you know people getting in shape uh <laughs> you know as opposed to all these you know vaccines and everything well reminds me of uh, something i read in uh, kevin phillips's book wealth and democracy some years ago about the num the number one return on investment in the united states since uh 1776 the number one return higher than real estate higher than gold, um, you know, higher than any, you know, commodity or speculative uh, asset. Does anybody know what it is? Probably drugs. Nope. Good, good guess though. Well, what is it? The, the number one return uh, on investment is political campaign contributions. <laughs> and, uh, and I noticed that Pfizer gave Biden Three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a campaign contribution, now, and they've got like now billions in contracts from the government uh, to produce these vaccines for ad ad infinitum, and of course they have the the you know the rules in there that they can't get sued and things like that. 
So, uh, uh, I, I also read that, uh, as I think, I think Brian mentioned, yeah, I remember seeing, uh, some articles, I think, and some of them might've been from England, but or some of the United States too, uh, showing that actually, uh, people that had, you know, that had previously had COVID and, uh, you know, then were not vaccinated, they were actually, uh, <laughs> They were actually uh, more resistant to the virus than the vaccinated people, um, you know, later on. So, so being unvaccinated, if you were, you know, already had the antibodies, looked like that was a pretty good, uh, you know, pr uh, there was a pretty good defense against uh, reinfection. And uh, it's a shame that like so many people were fired from their jobs and everything uh because they 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 didn't want to take the vaccination and they had already had had covid um <clears throat> now this uh this long covid I, i'm a little i'm a little skeptical it sounds like you know i don't know i just i'm just a, i just have to be a little bit skeptical of it it seems like it seems like people are trying to start a new uh special interest group you know so we you know, everybody has their little, everybody has to be a victim, join some victims group and get special treatment. So I'm imagining that, you know, yeah, someone's, you know, everybody's trying to get into this long COVID special interest group now so they can get some kind of, uh, you know, early SSI or some other kind of, you know, scam. So uh, I'm really uh, hesitant about that. And I, I know at work, uh, we have a case where uh, we're suing a, a company and um, the owner is uh, the, he's he's rep he's a pro uh, a, a pro se uh, attorney means he's representing himself, which we always say that you know a client who represents himself is you know has a you know, fool for a lawyer or something like that. Uh, so, but this guy <clears throat> we tried to uh, been trying to depose him for I don't know maybe a year or something and he never comes to his depositions and his excuse is that he has, he has long COVID. So, you know, we've offered to do these depositions via uh, zoom, you know, or in person or over the phone. And the guy just, you know, just totally not participating in his case at all. And I guess, the excuse is always because he has COVID. Matter of fact, we don't even get to speak with him. We have to speak to an assistant, you know, go through an assistant through email. And uh, so, <clears throat> so this is like, you know, kind of thing that you're going to see is, you know, people are going to be using this for a crutch uh, for probably all kinds of things. Yeah. And uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a little bit, uh, you know, hesitant to totally accept the all this long covid stuff okay thanks bob that's about six minutes mm -hmm. all right okay. tom you had said you, kind of, you wanted to say something so i apologize i didn't catch you earlier but please go ahead you got six minutes and uh, go all ahead. anyway the uh by the way bob uh, tom barry is our other chairman for our thursday college of complexes meeting so if you want to do a plug for dallas please do so yeah we have we have a meeting in dallas on thursday nights so same as this. Anyway, it, it's uh, something you may want to attend. It's up to you. Uh, <clears throat> the one thing that struck me was that uh, one of the speakers here said that he was he was blasting uh, the, the fact that we have pe more tests and we shouldn't have tests and so on. Uh, I'm reminded of polio. Remember when we had polio? If you didn't have a polio test, if you didn't have a polio vaccine, you, you, you got polio, you were in, you were in bad trouble. And uh, we got over that and maybe we'll get over this. Uh, we, we, we've been, another thing is if you get COVID and you've already been vaccinated, you don't end up in the hospital on a, on a, uh, on a <clears throat> and dying in the hospital or, or, or barely living. Uh, that's, that's something you avoid. So uh, vaccines are, are a good thing. And uh, that, that's my view anyway. Uh, I was at a conference here in uh, California, uh, NARV, N -E -R -V -R -E, which is a National Railroad Retirees. And uh, there was a 
uh, spread of, there was, well, there was food poisoning to begin with, which I ended up getting. And uh, so we were sick one night, really bad. And, uh, and then some of the people went home that night and uh, they got sick on the airplane. So I heard these stories, it was pretty bad. So, uh, and my wife got COVID, uh, so that's not good. But uh, she's got it now, but it, it, uh, it's, it's a lot milder than it would be if we didn't have vaccination. And uh, there's some pills you can take. So they're, they're supplied, they, they were free, so that's good. And uh, so I guess figure isolate for about five days, we might be over it. Uh, but <clears throat> my point is, is that, that uh, I, I think having vaccinations is a good thing. It's, it's a step in the right direction. And I don't, I don't blast anything on the government for it. Uh, they, they, they did do what they could, and we're, we're, we're meeting the challenges as it, as it exists, and we'll continue to meet it. And luckily, the, the uh, permutations of this uh, thing will diminish, and it won't be as strong each time. So that's, that's hopeful. Anyway, I better shut up while I'm ahead and give it back to uh, Charlie or whoever is next. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, Charlie, you're going to be our last rebutter tonight. I've got one in there, but uh, go ahead. Uh, and Carrie, you want to speak now? Okay, you want to do a rebuttal, Carrie? That's fine. Charlie, do you want to go before Carrie or after? No, no, I'll go last. All right, Carrie, go ahead. Please. Okay, a, a bunch of little things. Um, somebody commented about uh, the Japan. I think I think it's Japan required is making every, weighing everybody and those that are overweight. A required exercise every day. Um, uh, every, everybody here, I'm sure, had, had, had a mandated polio vaccine, smallpox vaccine, and a whole bunch of others. So it's not like the first time something's been, been mandated. Um, the, the, you, you, the life expectancy in the US has already gone down by two years from COVID. I'm assuming because people that, that recover from COVID are not as healthy, it's going to go down by another two years or so as those people die younger than they would have otherwise. Um, long COVID can be mild. I know somebody had long COVID, has long COVID, but it's, it's, for him it's limited to his taste, his, his smell and taste came back, but only partly. So he has this big collection of, of fine whiskeys, but he can't tell the difference between a rock duck and a good whiskey. That He really misses that. Um, I think, I think we should call out the National Guard and go door to door and make sure everybody gets vaccinated. Yeah. I'm done. Okay. Um, all right. Is there anybody else who's got a rebuttal before we let Charlie uh, bloviate for a while? Okay. Um, I just want to do a quick two or three minute rebuttal, if you don't mind before we get into Charlie. And that is, I, you know, so a friend of mine told me uh, about a year ago that there's never been a better time for a pandemic than it is today. Now I know it kind of may sound cynical, but my friend uh, told me that, you know, if you look at the flowering of human society with the upgrades in technology, the increased medical knowledge, the development of the COVID vaccine within a year, the possibility for remote schooling, remote work, we're actually a lot better off in coping than we would have been even 10 years ago. And that, you know, you shouldn't be looking at the world in such uh, catastrophic uh, and such devastating ways. But I, my own view on this whole thing is, uh, it goes back to Pulitzer and uh, Hearst, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. We are now on a 24 seven news cycle. So you can get bleeding every 24 seven on every news ch channel in the, in the area. And you know, what, what is actually happening now with the development of the internet and publishing and all this other stuff is that it's just a lot easier for people to get up on, on the media and for people to follow them. And I think that's a good thing that we've had for quite a while. Sure, it's gonna be more education for everybody to know what's true and what's false, but you know, at the same time, uh, we are a lot better off than we think we are. Um, you know, access to globalization and the increase in uh, world trade and everything else has made the world a lot more peaceful place, except for this anomaly with Putin and a few of these other 
war states, we've actually seen a lot better things with the rise of democracy, the rise of uh, things. Most of my findings are based on a site called uh, humanprogress.org. Uh, there's a gentleman out, his name is Johan Norberg, who's actually gotten into the nitty gritty of the statistics. And he said, it's very much like this. 200 years ago, 10% of the world could read and write. Now it's 90%. He said went, life went from 38, roughly an average of 38, about 200 years ago to well over 70 years now. Yes, we're seeing a little bit of a decrease because of COVID, but at the same time, we also have a lot more knowledge about the disease than we even did when we first started. So I'm, I'm, I'm of a mindset that, you know, we're actually haven't even begun to see the, some of the things that are going to be happening in the next 10 years, as far as the you know, life extension, uh, medical breakthroughs, um, even reading that book by uh, Code Breakers by, uh, and the development of the gene uh, therapy and everything else has really been a fascinating thing. And uh, I'm just seeing a, a much more hopeful world than, than I did. And that, you know, how is it that in the midst of human flowering that we're actually very cynical, you know, and that'll be my take on it. I'm just hoping that uh, we actually are a lot better off than we think we are in a lot of ways. Okay, and that's the end of my, my rebuttal. Charlie, go ahead. All right. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our speaker in two regards. Thank you, one, for your presentation. And number two, thank you for your efforts uh, regarding COVID. You probably are the most worthwhile organization that I've had the pleasure of booking in a long time. I recommend everybody maybe make a little contribution to further their efforts. I got exactly five things to cover. Uh, I'm amazed that Tim, he seems to think that a million people have perished, but this is the best of times. I don't, but anyhow, I'm in a group called the People's Response Network to COVID in Chicago. And we've been focusing on the uh, needs, the effects of the virus um, in the black and brown communities in the poor parts of the city in particular. Long ago, there was discussion about all the hospitals across the United States were setting up clinics specifically to deal with long COVID. This was years ago. Uh, it was discussed and brought out. Okay, that's number two. I represent employees and we put in requests for what is called a reasonable accommodation if you have a handicapping condition. And the employers, very often, you have to prove that you have a handicapping condition. The, child, the employer will challenge it. The legal term for this is called controvert. These are the, by far and away the most complicated cases I've ever handled as a representative. They drag on for years. They will constantly ask for medical criteria. And this one is a perfect storm. Uh, you can stem the symptoms and so forth. This is going to be an incredible situation if an employer challenges the, the fact that the employee may have a handicapping condition and is not entitled to reasonable accommodation. In that regard, the entire 1,000 employees in my bargaining unit before the pandemic were already set up and scheduled to work at home as alternative work schedules. So I was ahead of the game. Um, chronic fatigue syndrome. My companion, Lois, suffered from this. I've looked into the topic in significant detail. Believe you me, you do not want to get chronic fatigue syndrome. She was incapable of going through a religious service, listening to a concert, attending a lecture through her entirety. I think I woke her up uh, at least 500 times in our relationship easily. You do not want to mess with that. I assure you, the alternative people were getting involved in this, claiming it, and some people, it is a difficult, difficult illness to diagnose. The next thing is, uh, today I was talking about minority communities. I looked up the Native Americans. They have powwows on, on in the internet. You can watch it live. 
And as soon as I logged in, there was a, a thing popped up, what do you call it, a, a pop-up that said, get your shaft, here's how to get vaccinated. For the Native Americans were, the first thing when you logged into the site was information on how to get a vaccination and more power to them. They're taking care of their people. Now, regarding mitigations and, and prevent, preventive measures, I don't care what, I was a safety engineer, I still am a safety engineer representing trades and crafts, and mechanics and so forth, and carpenters. And whatever that safety engineers, whatever safety measures uh, are applied, you do them. And you try to do twice as much, I always said. And any employee who didn't follow them, I didn't defend. I said, you got, you, you chose, and you don't look for a loophole. If it says this is a safety practice, you do it. And that's Charlie Paddock will tell you that. I'll tell you employ that. Um, the, uh, th this nonsense here. Now, the reason you get a vaccination is that you don't give it, so you don't get, make your coworkers sick. Do you think you have an employee right to bring an illness into the workplace? Well, that's ridiculous. Who's, who's maintaining that? Now, yeah, you're, you're not in, you don't have a right to a job. You don't have a right to bring in illness to make other people sick. We're gonna live, that's a civil liberty. Anyhow, what's this other thing here? How they reach their life expectancy. What the hell is that supposed to mean? And so if my friend of mine dies, I'm supposed to say, well, he reaches life expectancy. Come on, I, I don't wanna even listen to this kind of stuff. Mm. Anyhow, um, Listen, if they tell you, you know, I got, I even got my last booster shot. I almost, I, I hadn't gone the, the, the extended time frame. I'm not going to muck around with this. You get a vaccinated and you're not going to probably go in the hospital and you're not going to die. That's good enough for Charlie and it should be good enough for everyone here tonight. Thank you very much. Come back and report on progress of your project. Thank you very much. All right. Marty, that's the last of our rebutters. It's only 8.13. Wow, I thought it would be a lot uh, later. All right, so you, Marty, you get the last word before we adjourn for this evening. So take as long as you need to um, to uh, talk to us about what you heard tonight, or if you just want to sign off at the end, that's fine. I'll keep the Zoom call open for a little while if you'd like afterwards, after we're done with our official program. So you go ahead, Marty, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, just just to touch base, just just a few things if I'm remembering. I'm an hour ahead of you guys too. Um, it's getting past my bedtime. Um, <laughs> I uh, so long COVID is not new. It's not new. It is a post viral infection. So what? Looking at the good and the bad, right? We have how many millions and millions and millions of people get long COVID? 40% of those are going to have some kind of um, lasting symptom or uh, temporary disability, permanent disability. Um, these, the, this is not new. Post viral infections are not new. This is going to happen. Um, uh, what else did I did I want to want to address? Um, uh, you'll have to forgive me because I am getting uh, a little tired. But um, get get a booster shot. It, it, you have to have vaccines to go to school. Um, and uh, I, bull, I, I hope that COVID vaccines um, will be uh, mandated for, for kids to go to school when everybody can have one. Um, I, 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 I am guessing what, a, what I'm hoping and what I will probably happen is that we will be getting a, um, a COVID vaccine every year um, based on the, uh, 
uh, variant that's that's coming around just like the flu. Um, however, I, I'm very concerned that um, these new variants that, that are coming through are gonna make a lot more than one third of our cases break through. Um, so I, my, my hope is that you learn something tonight, that you wear a mask, uh, stay six feet apart as much as possible, be outside around people, don't be in large groups, um, just for your own personal safety and your families, um, people that you love, I would strongly recommend um, still doing those things. Um, and I am very happy to uh, communicate with anybody. I put my email in the chat if you have any questions or follow up and I will, um, I'll send you guys some links to different research uh, hubs that, that we look at and to different um, social media people um, who, uh, who are good uh, and know what they're talking about. Um, so thank you again. I really appreciate um, having the opportunity to talk to you guys and um, I'm glad I could be here. Thanks. Okay, based on that, we'll uh, officially adjourn the college tonight, but if you guys wanna stick around for a little while, I'll be more than happy to do so. Um, with that, I'm gonna adjourn the college and officially stop the recording.